Good afternoon and welcome to our series on STEM careers this afternoon. And sorry, my computer just sent me. <laughs> uh, the series are supported by the Victorian Challenge and Enrichment Series. And as we begin and gather for this meeting from different places around Australia, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands from which we meet. I am joining you today from Ngunnawal and Ngambri lands, and I pay respect to part leaders past, present, and to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who join us online today. As we share and discuss our own knowledge and practices, we acknowledge the deep knowledge forever embedded in custodianship of country. And today we are gonna hear from uh, Dr. Erin Hahn, who's from the CSIRO, and she's gonna tell us about her career and her work. And she um, joins us now. So welcome, Erin. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and Yuma, I'm also joining you from Ngunnawal and Nambri country. Uh, let me just get my slides here. There we go. We can see that. You get thumbs up. Yeah, we're all good. Oh, good. Okay. So today I've been advertised as talking to you about whether or not you'd like to travel back in time. Uh, I am not exactly a time traveler. I don't have a time machine per se, because what I am is a conservation geneticist. I look at the DNA that uh, is in wildlife, and I use that to get information to give to wildlife managers to better protect and preserve the diversity of species that we have on our planet. So today I'm going to talk to you a bit about why I do what I do, what I do, and how I got to be where I am. And hopefully you all have tons and tons of questions for me at the end. Normally what I do when I give talks like this is I have lots of students in front of me and it's much more of an interactive, but I'm gonna to try to keep the kind of spiel that I'm gonna give you um, kind of short and sweet. And then we'll get to all of those questions because this is your opportunity to talk to a researcher such as myself and get lots of information about what it's like to be a scientist. And if you have aspirations of doing anything in science, ask me lots of questions about what you can do to prepare yourself or how you can think about um, what a career like this might be. So first, I will start out uh, by telling you why I do what I do, because I think it's really important when you're talking to people in various careers to understand what motivates them to undertake the work that, they're, that they do every day. It's no surprise to any of you that our environment is changing. Here in Canberra alone in the last couple of years, we've seen massive historical hailstorms. Of course, we've all been touched by bushfires and the smoke that would be falling on from them, the massive heat waves, uh, the flooding events that we've seen over the past couple of years and we're likely to see in the next couple of days. Um, and of course, the COVID pandemic, which has its um, lots of ties to wildlife, to our unchanging environment. And I, you know, over the past few decades have been noticing this change like many of you. And I have been concerned quite greatly in how this affects people, but also how it affects wildlife. So for example, this thorny devil here, we'll use it as an example. All of these different factors in our changing environment are having an effect on wildlife. And we're seeing this in elevating rates of extinction. We're seeing it in changes in where animals are found. We're seeing changes in the numbers and abundance of animals. We're also seeing it in the introduction of new invasive species. So we have big mouse plagues booming in parts of the country. And this is all driven by our changing planet. And so at the beginning of the talk, I said, I'm not exactly a time traveler, but what I use is information about museum from museum specimens. So these would be animals that were collected over the last 100 to 300 years ago um, at times, different times in our history to gain information about how animals in particular have responded to this change. We can get information from these specimens that are um, locked away in our museum vaults to learn about how animals have adapted or maybe not to this 
these changes in the environment to then give information to wildlife managers to say, this species is doing well, this one's not, this is how we can improve the situation for a given population in order to better protect them. So now I'll get a little bit into what I do on a day-to-day -day basis and where I do it. I work at the Australian National Wildlife Collection. I'm a postdoctoral fellow, which means that I have my PhD and I've been working independently as a researcher for about five years now. At the Australian National Wildlife Collection, we focus mainly on vertebrates. So we have reptiles, amphibians, birds, and mammals collected from places all around Australia, as well as in Papua New Guinea and Indonesia. And we have a really good representation of not just the different species that are uh, in this corner of the world, but also the diversity found in the species, because we have lots of representative individuals from each species in different populations. We have preserved specimens from lots of different species that we preserve in different ways. And some of them, like you might see in these dried specimens sort of on the right hand side where we have a few mammals here and we have big drawers of birds. Um, they've been preserved by drying because we want to look at like the coloration, we want to look at the changes uh, in the way that the feather feathers are distributed, we might see, you know, changes in the coat length of a particular species, which might be a response to temperature change. But not all specimens uh, lend themselves particularly well to drying, like if you've ever seen um, a dried frog, they don't look particularly very much like the living thing. So for those types of specimens, we put them in a chemical called formaldehyde, which kind of freezes everything in, in like space like this. And then we put them in ethanol for long term storage uh, in a jar like this little critter over here. We also have a whole collection of skeletons um, from lots of different species, and this would give us information about um, changes like in their bone density, perhaps in response to um, nutrient availability or the size of their teeth, which might change in response to what they're eating. Uh, we also have a quite extensive egg collection, and so this would be clutches of eggs from species of birds from all around um, this part of the world. Um, Notably with eggs, we are not allowed to collect eggs ourselves, um, neither is anyone else. It's illegal to go and collect eggs because if you're collecting an egg, that individual never had an opportunity to reproduce. And so you're, you're making a much bigger dent on the population by collecting that specimen and holding it in a museum. Whereas most of the other specimens in our collection had the opportunity to reproduce before they were sampled to keep um, that individual in the collection. We have eggs because people were illegally collecting eggs and then those were either given to us by uh, an investigation or the police or someone came to us and said so my grandpa had this big garage full of eggs do you want them and we say of course we do this will give us lots of information about species of birds and so we have this large collection in part because people acted illegally in the past um, but we're quite grateful because it gives us lots of information about birds that we otherwise wouldn't have gotten um, so i spend my days working a bit with the collection and looking in drawers and looking at differences in the animals. But because I'm a geneticist, I spend a lot more time uh, in the laboratory. And so my environment looks a lot more like this. I have pipettes, I have jars and all sorts of things. Uh, and the things that I'm man manipulating on a day-to-day -day basis don't look like a bird with pretty feathers. It looks more like tubes full of what looks like empty stuff because I'm looking at their DNA. From an individual specimen, so again, we'll take that thorny devil that has been preserved in a jar. What I do is I go in and I take a tiny piece and I pull out the DNA, which encodes all of the different things that the animal can do. And it tells us about how the animal can respond to its environment. With that information, I'm able to answer all sorts of questions. So for example, I can tell 
who that individual was related to. I can tell how it is related, not just to different species, but also to animals that look quite a lot like it. So I can tell um, how animals have been breeding over time. So I can get that family tree information from just the DNA from an individual specimen. I can also look at how animals have moved over time. So if you have a changing environment, if you have changes in food availability, I can look at how I can track populations and how they've moved across the environment over time. I can also pick up differences in individual specimens that are, are response, a physiological response to something like environmental change. So for example, here you can see that this individual has changed in its coloration, but there's lots of ways that animals can change without looking physically different. So you have to look at their DNA. So maybe their immune function has changed or their kidney function, or perhaps you know, there's some residue on it from what it was eating. You know, I can pick these things up with DNA that someone who's just looking at it or using tools to, to physically identify things, even with a microscope, can't pick up. So this information that I'm pulling out of each individual specimen, I'm then able to give back to the wildlife managers in order to rehabilitate endangered species because they then know more about which environments the animals are best adapted to, uh, who the, maybe who their key predators are or what their prey might be uh, and how they're responding to the planet so that they can put into action these management plans to improve wildlife outcomes. So now that you know a little bit about what I do, why I do it, I will go kind of take you on a journey of how I got to be where I am. Um, the, my path to being a postdoctoral fellow is has been a windy one. When you talk to people who are in the middle of their career, it often seems like they knew exactly where they were going from the very beginning and they were hugely successful because they had this big plan. And I will tell you that if they say that, they are lying. Most of the time, people who are in a position like myself tried out lots of different careers until something really resonated. Um, there were probably some moments in their career where they were not particularly happy with what they're doing. And I feel that that's, it's best to be honest with people who, like yourself, are just at the very beginning of picking out where you're going to want to go so that you have a realistic expectation of what, what's in store for you. Um, so throughout my, my life and my career, I've had a number of people who have been really influential in helping me determine where I wanted to go with my life. Uh, and that first, first person would be my grandmother. She was born in 1930. Uh, and at that time, it was not very common for women to go to university. But despite that, she went to university in the United States and she got a degree in biology of all things, which again was exceedingly rare for a woman at that time to go and get a university degree in the sciences. She raised a big family while doing all of this and decided to put her degree in biology to good use in teaching high school biology. And she was a high school biologist when I was a little kid and she used to take me into her high school biology classroom and behind her big desk was this wall of preserved specimens in jars. So there was like the proverbial frog in a jar in a high school biology class, which was one of my first introductions to seeing specimens uh, preserved in that way. Um, at the time I was living in New Jersey, which is in the United States, just outside of New York City. It's an urban or, or like a rural area. And so I had lots of opportunities to go out and you know, be amongst wildlife. And so I went on lots of hikes. I would have considered myself quite the wildlife enthusiast uh, and continued to um, go on, you know, lots of adventures, you know, throughout my, my childhood and in high school. And um, it was my grandmother who really inspired that love for nature as well as science um, in me. Uh, but when I was in high school, I had this love for nature and this love for science. And because I'd never met a scientist, I had no idea what it was that scientists actually did. In my mind, they were this old white dude who walked in around in a laboratory holding a beaker of bubbly stuff. I didn't really know. Um, and I enjoyed being out in nature, but I didn't see how the two would ever come together and actually be a career. 
Um, and so I had these two things that I cared a whole lot about, but no one really talked to me about how to make a career out of them. So I was a bit bumbling after high school. I didn't know what I wanted to do in university. I tried out a couple of different degree programs. I think I was a business major, architect major. Um, at some point, I think that I had an economics degree in there. I don't know. Um, tried a bunch of things, nothing was working. So I just decided to take a year off and explore a little bit. I wound up hopping in my car and moving nearly all the way across the country to the state of New Mexico, which is a very different environment. It's high desert, uh, there's big mountains. Um, and it was there that I, again, reconnected with, uh, with wildlife and my, my love for nature. And I decided at that point, I don't really know what biologists do, but I'm gonna to go to university and I'm gonna get a biology degree. So I enrolled in the University of New Mexico and started taking classes in anything to do with biology. And it was there that I fell in love with genetics. Everything to do with the DNA, everything to do with the genome absolutely excited me. I found the topics that I was learning to be really intuitive. Um, I really loved chemistry and I decided to further my learning uh, in, in the biological sciences by pursuing a um, an honors program. So I enrolled in a laboratory where I started working with the model system Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is Baker's yeast. And I started learning about the spliceosome, which is part of the cellular machinery that takes the genome and turns it into an animal. And I thought, this is really cool, but I still have no idea how to make this work with wildlife. What is it that I do with this? Uh, and this is another point in my career where someone who stepped in was really influential in my life and someone that you may all be familiar with, Steve Irwin, the crocodile hunter. I was a big fan of his show when I was a teenager and I would stay up all night watching it, just absolutely obsessed with him. And when I was in university, I was about third year in uni, I heard the really tragic news that he had passed away quite suddenly. And it hit me like a ton of bricks. And I realized that something that was so powerful about Steve Irwin was that he took what he was really, really good at, which was talking to a camera and being extremely enthusiastic and infectiously getting people excited about wildlife. And he applied that to getting people concerned and caring about the species that he cared about. And I said, that's, that's the ticket. That's how you have a successful career that you enjoy. You take what drives you and what you're good at, and you combine that. So I went to my computer and I pulled up Google, which is this new fancy thing. Uh, and I typed in conservation genetics. That's what I care about. That's what I wanna do. And I found out that there's PhD programs in how to be a conservation geneticist. So after uni, I packed up and moved just a little bit further west uh, to the University of Arizona, where I started a PhD program with Dr. Melanie Culver here um, with a very passed out mountain lion. Uh, Melanie studies mountain lions and helps them recover the populations that have been depressed due to overhunting. And so I saw what she did and I said, I want to do that too. So I did my PhD studying pronghorn, which are an undulate that look a lot like deer, but they're more closely related to giraffes. And their population has been largely depressed due to um, drought, due to uh, loss of their forage food, as well as overhunting. And it's there that I started working with museum specimens because the population in Arizona had been depressed so much so that they had started a um, a program to put them into captive breeding and hopefully reintroduce them into the wild. But the population had been lost from the environment for so long that they didn't know where to re-release them to. Um, so they contacted our lab and they said, hey, can you figure out where these pronghorns should go? And so I took it upon myself to go out and find a whole bunch of museum specimens, take DNA out of them, take some DNA from the modern contemporary population and compare them. And I found that the populations that they're, or the, the uh, captive population that they were breeding in Arizona was most closely related to some um, animals that used to live in California. And I advised the management managers that if you're gonna release them, you should release them into Arizona rather than Mexico because that's probably where they're best adapted to. 
So while I was doing my PhD, the uh, field of genomics was exploding. And so I got to spend a lot of time not in the field necessarily, but working with big, huge data files and learning how to do lots of coding. And this worked really well for me because another thing that came along while I was in my PhD was my two daughters, which meant that I couldn't spend as much time out doing field work as maybe some of my classmates who didn't have kids. But because I was working so much in an analytical perspective, I could take my work with me, I could be at home, I could be with my kids, and I could really balance uh, being a mom with being a scientist. And so being a data scientist worked really well for me. So after about five years, I finished up my PhD and I moved out here to Australia and specifically to Canberra, where I got a very coveted position as a postdoctoral fellow at the Australian National University. Uh, at the ANU, I was working with marine sponges, which are these filter feeder creatures that live uh, in the bottom of the ocean. And I got to do field work at this point because my kids were a bit older and I was working on assembling the genome of a marine sponge that lives in Jervis Bay. So after about a year working at ANU, unfortunately, my workplace became quite toxic. I was not getting the support that I needed from my colleagues and my supervisors, and I made the very difficult decision to leave this prestigious uh, position that I had secured at the ANU. I thought that I was taking a step down. I, this is the greatest fear that a lot of people have where they've gotten so far in their career, they finally made it and they don't like it. So I pulled everything I could together and I said, I'm, I'm gonna go find a job where I feel better supported by my colleagues. And I thought I was taking a step down, but in reality, what I was doing was making the decision that my happiness and my mental health mattered more than the prestige of my title. So I left and I took up a research technician position at the CSIRO and this opened up huge doors for me because I was back uh, working with museum specimens, something that really spoke to me that I could be this historical DNA detective. And what I loved about that position was not just the specimens that I was working with, but the people that I was working with, because they were just as excited about solving the problems um, that are facing wildlife as I am. And so very quickly they saw that I was doing great work. And so they put me back into a postdoctoral fellowship and I'm now back on the path to using DNA to help uh, wildlife recover from our deteriorating environment, which is what's got me really excited. So I may have gone a little bit for, uh, on a little bit longer than I had intended to, but again, it's because I just love what I do so much. And uh, what I'd like to do now is kind of turn it back on you to think about if you could time travel, what would you do? Or if you could employ any other skill that you think you have to something that you care a whole lot about, what would you do? Because that's what I've done. And that's, I believe, what's worked really, really well for me. And so with that, I think I'll open it up to you if you have any questions. It's really, really great, Erin. <laughs> I was sitting here just enjoying every minute of it. We do have a Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. So if you do have questions, definitely plug them in there. And, you know, if you're really left field, we'll, we'll try and answer <laughs> everything. But I, um, I really kind of enjoyed that you said you're you know, biology teaching grandmother had the specimen jars in her actual classroom, which was fantastic. <laughs> and it goes to show science has, has happened uh, a long, you know, a long, long time ago and, and different ways of running it before DNA actually happened. So, because um, the, just to ex kind of explain a little bit, the reason museum have all these kind of drawers of specimens is because there's little variations, isn't it? The, the visual variations as opposed to the DNA variation that they have in them, but it's, it's a wealth of kind of knowledge that's in there. And um, I just wanted to touch on a little something from the worksheet that we've sent as well is the difference between the ones in jars and the ones in the drawers in terms of how they're preserved and how helpful they are to us now as, as kind of analyzing DNA. Yeah, it's amazing that I'm able to get DNA out of the formal and preserved specimens because when they were originally put in jars 60 to 100 years ago, I actually got a whole bunch of really, really good data out of a water dragon that was preserved in 1905. So this is unheard of in my field of work. And these were put in jars, never even 
thinking that some researcher would someday want to get DNA out of it because they didn't know what it was. So <laughs> it's amazing that we're able to get this information um, from all of these specimens that were preserved in different ways. And the museums were preserving them mostly, yeah, like you said, because of the way they looked um, and the methods they were using were the methods that they had at the time. In fact, we have some specimens that were like, plucked in some some spirit, some literal spirit, <laughs> some whiskey, because that's what the researchers had with them. And it did an okay job of preserving it. Fantastic. We have had one question um, that if you can extract the DNA and transfer it of something that's instinct, can you give it to a living animal without any adverse effects in terms of being able to implant it? Yeah. I always get this question. <laughs> um, we could. The question really is whether we should. Yeah. Because the effect of transferring that DNA, you're putting a little piece of DNA into the context of their whole genome. And you need to be sure that it's going to do what you think it's going to do. And so we do very, very, very extensive testing if we're ever going to try something like that. Uh, the other question I often get is if you can take DNA out of an extinct animal, which we've done, we've worked with the Tasmanian tiger. Can you bring it back like Jurassic Park style? Can you bring <laughs> it back? Again, I want to say, should you? Like these animals, they've gone extinct for a reason, likely because their environment has changed so much so that it's no longer going to support that animal. And so we have to think about whether or not we're putting them into environments that they're going to be particularly well suited to, to live in. Yeah, and that's always kind of the other side of the thing, isn't it? Just because we have them, we have somewhere they're going to live. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I was really um, excited when you said you kind of moved all the way to New Mexico <laughs> for for to, for an actual kind of study and to, to chase that. Was that kind of a, a very scary, hard thing? I mean, you moved New Mexico, Arizona, obviously much farther to come <laughs> to Canberra. Uh, that, that kind of first step to say, I'm going to go somewhere because I know the thing I want to do is there. For me, no. Um, <laughs> for my mother, yes. <laughs> Um, the moment I left for university, she was standing in the driveway, tears coming down her face. I was the type of teenager who just wanted to go and go and find and explore. But I know that that's not, that's not for everyone. Um, my mom was even more upset when I moved just further away to Arizona and then finally to Australia. And when I became a citizen a few weeks ago, she's like, really? <laughs> you're never coming back <laughs> never coming back and I was like actually it could I moved to Antarctica there's this project down there um but choosing where you go to university you know whether or not that's going to be a place that's close to family whether it's close to the beach because you like to go to the beach I mean all that really matters in picking where the setting of where you're going to be learning in order to study for your future career because it honestly it all ties in together yeah it does definitely help um, Stephanie is on our questions has asked if you could bring an extinct species back, which animal would you choose? Oh gosh. <laughs> oh gosh. I mean, I think the dodo is just the coolest, dorkiest looking thing. And I would really like to know what it sounds like. So if if I could, maybe, maybe that one. <laughs> We kind of caught that in your backyard, just get it out. Yeah, yeah. I think that would be really cool. <laughs> it really is. Um, with the, the specimen jars, I've had someone else kind of question me, is, is, and also I was thinking, it in terms of getting the DNA out of it, do you have to kind of remove it or is it a process that you can kind of keep it in the, in the formaldehyde to get the DNA out? I just got a grant to look at exactly that. So currently what we have to do is go in, pick the specimen out of the jar and take a piece of the specimen, crush it up, put it in the microwave, put it in some soap and pull the DNA out. So we have to do damage to the specimen, which obviously the curators themselves, the museum isn't gonna be super happy with because someone may wanna go in and look at that later and then mm. determine something about it. And so if you destroy it, you remove that capability when it's a specimen like the one Tasmanian tiger that we have in our collection, they're not gonna let you do that. So the study that I have now is 
looking at whether or not we can go into the liquid itself in the jar and take a little bit up from like the skin cells that were shed off of the individual to get the DNA from that. Because then curators are gonna be like, yeah, sure, <laughs> take it, I don't care. Um, and genetics researchers are gonna get the information that they need. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I think it's it's the important thing, right? They've been preserved so long. We want to make sure we keep them for as, as long as possible. How does it feel walking in those collections and, you know, you're kind of surrounded by all these specimens around you? It's eerie sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in my old lab, we had a, a freezer full of, of uh, specimens and there was one point where I walked in and something grabbed me. And scratched me, and it turns out it was it was a, um, a bobcat. Someone had frozen the whole bobcat and it clawed me in the freezer. So that was that was interesting. Um, it's it's like walking through history, because it's not just the specimens that are in there, which are wildly fascinating. Like we have all sorts of birds of paradise from our collection, which of course I'm never going to get to go out in the field and see a bird of paradise, but I can look at specimens of them in the collection mm -hmm. um, or penguins. I would never get to go down and see penguins, but I can see them in my collection. But there's also the history of the collectors. So we have hundreds of people who have who contributed to the you know making of the collection that we have. And we have um, specimens in our collection, which were um, given to us by very, very famous um, biologists. And so it's, it's the history of why they were even collecting, what were they studying at the moment? What did they want to know? Um, and so that's what resulted in that individual being in our collection. And so we treat every single specimen like the absolutely irreplaceable thing that it is um, because it has all of this history tied into it. We wanna get the absolute most information that we can um, to use it to better protect our environment. Questions coming through from looks like Melrose High. So um, what is the, what do you predict is the next genetic adaptation for humans? What do you think you're gonna... <laughs> next genetic adaptation for humans? Hmm. Maybe adapting <laughs> to being crammed into apartments. <laughs> sure. <laughs> or <laughs> we're gonna get shorter so we can get through those small doors. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, you'd have to ask a human geneticist. I, I focus very much on wildlife because I figure there's plenty of people working on humans. Yeah. <laughs> so so what's your it's, I also want to know what your least favorite extinct species. What are you pretty glad is now extinct? <laughs> Are there any extinct mosquitoes? Probably. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope so. Yeah. Once you I, long <laughs> yeah, you have to think about species, not just in your relationship with them, but their, their relationship to the other species in their environment. So even mosquitoes, as much as we hate them, um, they're food for somebody. And so maybe they're food for another insect that you then, um, that feeds a bird that you really like. So everything's all tied together. So I, I try to not have favorites or least favorites and my understanding that everything is connected, but if there's any extinct mosquitoes, I wouldn't be sad for that. And, and you worked with um, sponges, which means very, you, you did lots of vertebrates and things, and then you kind of were working on sponges. Are they, is it, obviously the DNA is the same and things, but was it kind of, was there stuff you had to do to do the field work for them that was new for what you'd done previously? Well, I got to put my my scuba diving experience to good use when I was uh, doing marine sponges, uh, even though it was only in like three meter deep water in Jervis Bay. Um, but sponges are different, actually much more challenging than a lot of vertebrate species, you wouldn't think so because they're like the size of your pinky and they don't move one, you don't have to chase them. But their DNA is more tricky because in, in an individual, each one is essentially pregnant with lots of other individuals. And so it's a confusing mess of a city of DNA going on in there, which just makes sequencing it much, much more difficult. Whereas like if you're sequencing a human, they have two copies of the genome, one from mom, one from dad, and so long as you kind of tease those apart, then it's easy. But in sponges, it, it's a whole mess. So aside from not enjoying that laboratory environment, their genomes are just a mess and I wouldn't recommend. <laughs> I do not recommend. Um, in in uh, your kind of 
journey, you did talk a little bit about how your field work changed when you had your daughters and, and the, the balance that you kind of took from on, on that. And then also moving here and, and finding that. Do you find that doing the research gives you flexibility to balance work and life and social and, you know, things that are not science and not your job? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would say a career in science lends a great deal of flexibility um, for being a parent, for any other kind of activities that you'd like to do outside from just you know, working, um, because our jobs don't have to be nine to five. I can work the hours that I want to work. I can be in the lab or I can be at home doing data analysis. I can kind of schedule things around um, you know, what works for my family. And that isn't the case with, with all research jobs, because if you're working with a species that reproduces, so if you're working with plants and you have to go and water them at a certain time, or if you're working um, in a model system where you have to go and feed something, then you're tied to that as well, almost like a child. Um, but what's worked really, really well for me is just being communicate, being able to communicate with my supervisor, with, with my, uh, my PhD supervisor, with my honors supervisor. Uh, when I was interviewing with my PhD supervisor, Melanie, um, I was 11 weeks pregnant. She did not know this. And I remember her very distinctly saying, I love it when my PhD students have babies because then they become so much more diligent and, you know, managing their time. And I'm thinking, Okay, good. <laughs> so communication, be it about your desire to have a family, your desire, whatever to do you wanted. If you want to do more field work, if that's not your thing, finding yourself in an environment where you can talk openly about that and not feel ashamed of your decisions one way or another is really, really important. And often I think in the sciences, because it's such a competitive environment, students often feel like their needs don't matter because they should just feel fortunate to be in the position that they are, but they have a lot more power <laughs> than, than they're aware of and they should use it by, by speaking up for themselves. Yeah, and I think it's, it's, it's easier when you are passionate about the thing that you're doing and you say, I really want to do this, but I want to do this other thing family or travel whatever as well and speaking of travel uh how many people outside of australia do you collaborate with um across the world um quite a few it kind of depends on what project i'm working in uh because i don't work with any one particular species i get to work with pretty much whoever wants to use my technology um one of the projects that i tied up for my PhD was working with researchers who were in Mexico. So I was getting to work. Um, they were based in Mexico. One of them was Russian. So that's something about the sciences that we're kind of all from everywhere. And um, we wind up in different places around the world. So I'm working with a university in, in Mexico that has researchers from Russia. Uh, I was on the phone today um, talking about working on bluefin tuna uh, with a researcher who's in CSIRO, but he's also American and he's working with Spanish researchers and he's also working with these other people. So it's something that we're getting used to a lot more Zoom calls nowadays. And I think it's facilitating more cross collaboration between nations, which is pretty cool. I've heard that. I've heard that the Zoom has been advantageous. <laughs> <laughs> Even if it is queer, crazy times. And um, and I did notice that you said, you know, you came to ANU and it was your kind of this high dream job that you got. And it turned out to not be quite the dream that you envisaged. And is, is it, it was a tough for you, I know you kind of mentioned that to, to say, hey, I have to get out of this toxic environment in order to continue to, to be a person and, and to be healthy and in all aspects and what kind of yeah enabled you to say I'm going to take this step out was it someone you know getting the last straw or was it having the chance to somewhere else to go it is a bit of both um it was exceptionally difficult for me to make that decision because one I had traveled all the way across the world to take up this position um it was also the first job that I had that was 
paying any substantial amount of money. I was 35 and had my first like real job um, and I had my kids to support. So to have the potential loss of income was really, really scary. But because I was, I had a degree in science because I had experience, because I had good communication skills and all of these things that I had learned along the way in getting to that position, it made me applicable to other jobs. And so I kind of opened up the possibilities of what I might enjoy doing rather than what it is that someone with my qualifications should do. And so that's when I opened myself up to the opportunity of taking a downgrade to a research technician position, which then I was able to negotiate up um, because of my skill set to say, actually, I'm worth this, which I think was really what it boiled down to is that I had to look within myself and say, I'm worth more than the treatment that I'm getting in this particular environment. And so that kind of allowed me to do the scary thing, yeah. which I'm so grateful for that I did. <laughs> Yeah, and, and as you said, it is science degrees can be quite flexible in terms of the fact that there's a lot of other skills you pick up that aren't just your, your area that say, hey, I can change this into something else. And it's recognising that this skill is transferable to something else um, that science really, really gives you. So it's, yeah, I'm, I'm very pleased that you're in a good spot with CSIRO now and doing some wonderful stuff with us. And uh, what... What do you think is going to be the next thing you really, with the plan you'd really like to work with? I know you have got a grant for this next step. Is there something that you think there'd be an animal or something you'd really, really like to work on? I'm, I'm keen to get even more information out of the specimens that we have in the collection. So the work that I've done so far has been in getting the DNA from an individual. So from like that thorny devil in a jar. But what I think that we can do is get more information about how that animal interacted with the other players in its environment. So if I can look at its gut contents, if I can look and see what was it eating, can I genotype what it was eating in order to get information about what a, a recovering population might need to have available for it to eat. Or you might have heard about your microbiome. We all have bacteria and fungi living all over us and inside of us, uh, which is largely a good thing. And it helps protect us from the not so great things. And it also helps us digest our food and do all sorts of other functions. Well, other animals are exactly the same. And so what are the microbiomes of the different animals in our collections? And can we identify populations that are unhealthy based on their microbiome? Um, also being able to track the history of viruses through populations. So coronavirus that we're all terrified of now came ostensibly from a wildlife population. So if we're able to understand better, the viruses that we've had here in Australia will be better prepared to detect new ones. Is it something new or is it something we've had for a while? Is that infection that a koala is having, is that new or is it something that has been introduced? And so looking into the collections for those evidence, I think is the next phase for the work that I'm gonna be doing. Oh, it's a treasure trove sitting there <laughs> waiting to find out. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I've been to a few of those museums where you see it on show and, and now that I'm going to look at it with a whole different lens of what we can find out. For every specimen you see when you visit a collection or when you go to a museum and you see something behind the glass, there's a thousand other specimens that researchers are playing with behind the scenes. <laughs> that is mind blowing. <laughs> it's crazy. Uh, well, it has been really lovely listening to you talk about your work and your journey and um, and having a chat with you now about the questions and I'm sure our, our students in the audience have really enjoyed hearing about it and um, so I just wanted to thank you and thank our audience as well for coming today and all of you online there will be a survey sent if you can give us some feedback on how much you enjoyed today's talk and what we can include in further talks it would be really helpful to us and um, so I would say good afternoon thank you all.